Welcome to a world where darkness lurks and evil reigns. In this gripping video, we delve into two bone-chilling stories of true crime that will leave you on the edge of your seat. Brace yourself as we uncover the shocking details of the Snowtown murders, a horrific case that rocked a small Australian town to its core. But that's not all. Prepare to be fascinated and disturbed as we unravel the enigma of Danny Corwin, a serial killer with a twisted mind and a trail of victims in his wake. Get ready to enter a realm of darkness as we uncover crimes that defy the imagination. Before 1999, most people outside of South Australia had never heard of Snowtown. An unassuming country town, Snowtown is situated off a rural highway amongst South Australian farming land. It's the kind of small community that has dirt roads, a pub, a corner store, and not much else. Snowtown rarely gets visitors who aren't merely passing through. On the 20th of May 1999, Snowtown made headlines for the first time in the town's history. Multiple missing persons reports lead police to the town's abandoned former bank vault, inside of which they found six acid-filled barrels. The barrels contained the disintegrating corpses of eight deceased persons. Upon the discovery, the name Snowtown became synonymous with murder. The killing shocked Australia, which has a low homicide rate and hadn't seen such a large-scale atrocity before. The nation's shock intensified when it was revealed that the murders were not committed by a single, deranged psychopath. Instead, they were carried out by a group of four men. Eight bodies were found inside the barrels in the bank vault, although the men were responsible for 11 murders altogether. The killings were primarily carried out by three men, John Bunting, Robert Wagner, and James Vlasakis. A fourth man, Mark Hayden, was also convicted for helping to dispose of the bodies. The killings were incredibly violent, and most of the victims were tortured prior to death. Police found in possession of the murderous group a number of weapons used to torture their victims, including knives, saws, shotguns, rope, tape, and a metallurgy tool used for electrocution. John Bunting John Bunting, born on the 4th of September 1966 in Inala, Queensland, was the ringleader of the group. He was convicted for his role in the killings of 11 victims and was accused of a 12th which was unable to be proven. He is currently serving 11 life sentences without possibility of parole. Bunting demonstrated classic budding serial killer tendencies from childhood, disruptive in school, bullying other children, killing animals. He claimed to have been beaten and sexually assaulted by a friend's older brother when he was eight years old, inciting a hatred of pedophiles and homosexuals. Bunting had what he called a rock spider wall inside his house, a rock spider being an Australian slang term referring to pedophiles, commonly used in prisons. Bunting kept a chart tracking names and information about people he suspected of being pedophiles or homosexuals. Most of these claims were unfounded, based on flimsy rumors or his personal suspicions. On occasion, he would call random members listed on his wall and abuse them over the phone, saying they would get what's coming to them. Despite his clear instability, Bunting was described as a charismatic and convincing personality who somehow managed to corral several others into aiding in horrific crimes. Robert Wagner Robert Wagner, born on the 28th of November 1971 in Parramatta, New South Wales, partnered with John Bunting to carry out the Snowtown murders. He is currently serving 10 consecutive life sentences, although he only plead guilty to three of the charges. Wagner also possessed a hatred for pedophiles and cited this as his reason for participating in the killings, saying at his trial, pedophiles were doing terrible things to children. The authorities didn't do anything about it. I decided to take action. I took that action. Thank you. This is despite the fact that allegations of pedophilia committed by the victims were mainly unsubstantiated claims made by Bunting. Wagner and Bunting first met in 1991, before the killings began. With Bunting's encouragement, Wagner assisted in carrying out the tortures and murders of their victims. Wagner and Bunting were the only two of the group to commit cannibalism. The two men cooked and ate a piece of the flesh of their final victim, David Johnson. James Vlasakis James Vlasakis, born on the 24th of December 1979, 
is currently serving four life sentences in prison for his role in the murders. Flasakis is the stepson of Bunting, who was married to Flasakis' mother, Elizabeth Harvey. He first met Bunting when he was 14 years old. Flasakis was also a heroin addict and on a methadone program. As they lived together, Bunting spent a lot of time expressing his hatred of pedophiles to Flasakis, who later confessed that his older brother had molested him as a teenager. Bunting responded by suggesting that they bashed him for it. Flasakis, alongside Bunting and Wagner, eventually killed his brother, as well as his stepbrother. As well as his two brothers, Flasakis was also involved in the torture and murder of two others. He pleaded guilty to all four charges, and was granted a suppression order keeping his image out of the media in exchange for providing evidence against both Bunting and Wagner at trial. Flasakis was the key witness for the Crown Prosecution. Mark Hayden Mark Hayden, born on the 4th of December 1958, was not convicted of murder although was found guilty of assisting the other three men in disposing of two bodies. One was his wife, Elizabeth Hayden. He was not found guilty for her death although helped cover up the murder. He also helped with removing the body of Lasaki's brother. In 1999, Hayden rented out the old bank vault the men used to store the bodies in. He received a 25-year sentence for his crimes. The Victims Most of the victims were known to the Snowtown killers, either relatives, friends, or acquaintances. The killers committed social security fraud by taking the welfare payments of some of their victims, amassing around $95,000, although this was not their primary reason for committing murder. Bunting and Wagner believed themselves to be on a sort of moral crusade against pedophiles, although almost all of their claims against their victims were incorrect and unjustified. The killings occurred over a six-year timeline, from 1994 until 1999. Clinton Tresize, 22. Tresize was the first victim of John Bunting, whose body was found buried in a town near Adelaide in 1994. He was killed by Bunting with a hammer, who accused him of being a pedophile. The discovery of his body was reported on an Australian television show discussing it as an unsolved case. Upon seeing this, Bunting bragged to his stepson Blasakis about how it was his handiwork. Ray Davies, 26. Davies lived in a caravan on the property of a pensioner named Susanna Allen and was alleged to have sexually abused her grandchildren. He was strangled to death by Wagner, alongside Bunting. Michael Gardner, 19. Gardner's alleged crime was being homosexual, the teenager was an openly gay crossdresser, which incited Bunting's wrath against gay men. He was also strangled to death by both Wagner and Bunting. Barry Lane, 42. Also killed for being gay, Lane was formerly in a homosexual relationship with Wagner, ironic as both Wagner and Bunting claimed to abhor gay men. Lane was tortured and strangled, his body wrapped in carpet before being placed in one of the barrels. Thomas Trevelyan, age unknown. Trevelyan's death was originally ruled a suicide before it was later linked to the Snowtown killers. His body was found hanging from a tree in Adelaide. Trevelyan was a paranoid schizophrenic who suffered from hallucinations. He was also a former partner of Barry Lane and was alleged to have been involved in his death. Gavin Porter, 31. Porter briefly lived with Lasakis, as the two were both on the same methadone program. Whilst working on his car and under the influence of drugs, he fell asleep on the back seat. He was then strangled to death by both Bunting and Wagner. Troy Hyde, 21. Hyde was the older brother of Lasakis, who he claimed had sexually assaulted him as a child. It was believed Hyde was intellectually disabled. He was hit with planks multiple times by the three men whilst asleep, and was tortured before they killed him. Bunting forced you to apologize to Vlasakis before he died. It was the first murder Vlasakis was directly involved with. Frederick Brooks, 18. Brooks was the son of a woman named Jody Elliott, who was previously engaged to Bunting. His sister Elizabeth Hayden was also a victim, as she was the wife of perpetrator Mark Hayden. Brooks was handcuffed, gagged, and tortured before he was killed. 
The men used a tape recording of his voice to help cover up his disappearance. Gary O'Dwyer, 29. O'Dwyer was a welfare recipient who had suffered brain damage in a car crash, targeted by bunting for this so-called weakness. The three men visited his home under the pretense of having a few drinks, before torturing and killing him. Elizabeth Hayden, 37. Hayden's disappearance was a major factor that raised police suspicion. It was alleged she was targeted for refusing Bunting's sexual advances, as she was in a relationship with Mark Hayden. Her death was attributed to Bunting and Wagner, even though her husband helped dispose of her body. David Johnson, 24. The final Snowtown victim, Johnson was the stepbrother of Lasaki's. He was driven into Snowtown by his stepbrother, where the other two killers awaited. They strangled and beat him to death, chopping up his body to dispose of in the barrels where they kept eight of the victims. Part of Johnson's flesh was cannibalized by Bunting and Wagner, who claimed they hadn't had enough fun killing him. The Arrests and Trial Despite the name of the case, only one of the Snowtown murders actually happened in Snowtown. The rest occurred in various places across South Australia. The killers decided to move most of the bodies to the barrels in Snowtown after catching wind of an extensive criminal investigation looking into the multiple disappearances. Locals became suspicious about the newcomers and strange vehicles in their small community and alerted police, who were lead to the gruesome discovery inside the bank vault. The four men were arrested and three eventually charged with murder after a lengthy trial. It was the longest criminal trial in South Australia's history due to the number of victims and amount of information to go through. The three main perpetrators were all convicted of murder and will remain in Australian prisons for the rest of their lives. As Mark Hayden was not convicted of murder, he is serving a 25-year sentence. End of the first story, but the grisly truth of the Snowtown murders is a haunting reminder that evil can lurk in the most unexpected places, leaving a community shattered and scarred. And now, our journey into the depths of darkness continues with the enigmatic figure of Danny Corwin. Brace yourself as we delve into the mind of a serial killer, exploring the twisted motives, the chilling modus operandi, and the haunting mystery that surrounds this elusive and sinister individual. Daniel Lee Corwin Daniel Lee Corwin of Temple, Texas is a serial killer who is not often talked about. He was from a small town, upper middle class, and respected religious family. His father supervised a factory, however, at one point his family lost their home and had to move into a motorhome. He never seemed to fit in. He was quiet and in school, he would cut his nails with a hunting knife. He always had a blank face, flat effect. It may come as no surprise to you that he had killed his sister's cat in his youth. His first known sexual assault victim was a babysitter, his teenage neighbor. She noticed the sliding door was ajar, locking it behind her. A naked teenage Danny pops out, covers her mouth, and sexually assaults her. Before leaving the scene, he turns to her and asks for his shirt back then says, You don't know me, I live on the other side of the town. Months later he was investigated for the crime but passed the lie detector test and was never arrested. In 1975, he pushes himself into classmate Brenda Evans's car, wheels it out of the parking lot and drives a mile down into a rural area. She fights back and kicks him in the crotch. Then he slowly stabs the knife into her chest. She did not die as her prom may have saved her life. She lives to this day. Unfortunately, the Presbyterian Church intervenes in this case against him, claiming that he must have been led on and was lured into it by the victim. Rumors of Brenda being loose and wild spreads. They asked that he be given probation. A deal was made by her father to spare her from being traumatized all over again. Danny gets 40 years with a chance of parole. Texas prisons in the 1970s were overcrowded and he soon became popular with the people working in the prison as he knew how to work on their cars. At this time, he was put on antipsychotics but they ended up stopping as he did not like the side effects. He was then out of prison in six years. Danny went back to church after his release and babysits for a churchgoer named Becky. Becky was attracted to him and soon they became an item. 
Danny wasn't able to consummate their relationship and soon they grew apart. After Danny went to university in Madisonville, a 72-year-old named Alice Martin disappears walking her dog, then found several days later, cut up and raped. It's suspected that Danny was driving around scouting for victims. Later that fall, Deborah Irwin was found raped and stabbed to death in a rural area in Huntsville. Huntsville police called Danny's boss. He mentions that he's aware that Danny had a rape charge. When he was brought in, he seemed very polite to the police. They thought that since he seemed very nice that he was not involved and eventually let him go. The police claimed that he was compliant and not upset when he was brought in. At the time they chose to suspect Irwin's husband instead, even though he had an alibi. On Halloween, Mary Terrell Risinger and her four-year-old went to a beauty pageant with her daughter. On their way home, they stopped at an open-air car wash. Fifteen minutes after they had pulled up, three women rushed into the sheriff's office, which was nearby, saying a dead woman was in the car wash. A detective who was out trick-or-treating with his family happened to drop by and decided to go to the scene. When he arrived, a hose was still firing water. There was blood near a white car and in the car was a child in a red dress. She had kept the car locked and he convinced her to open it. When the doors opened she says to him the bad man killed mommy. Her dress wasn't red, it was white and soaked in blood. He checks for wounds, but the blood was not hers. At this point, the police still have not suspected Danny. However, his boss does notice Danny coming to work with a bandage across his hand. Following spring, Wendy Gant went out to ride her horse at Kyle Field. She got into her pickup. When she turned, Danny held a knife to her face. He ties her to the seatbelts. She tried to scream, but the windows were closed and no one heard her. He drives out of the area, claiming he was just taking her car. They went into a trail off in the woods and sexually assaulted her. He then ties her to a tree, slits her throat and leaves. Despite the wound, she was still alive. She manages to escape and cover her neck to slow the bleeding. He was still in the parking area so she quietly hid behind a tree until he left. Afterwards, she staggers into the parking lot and collapses. A county employee notices her and brings her to a hospital where she is stabilized. But she's unable to speak due to the injury. With written notes, she lets them know that she can recognize her attacker. A sketch artist was brought in. Wendy was determined to help them identify him. The next day the sketch was circulated and it was instantly recognizable as Danny Corwin. The state police call Danny's boss and tell him that this was their guy. The pickup truck was scanned for prints and they had a match. Danny had no idea that they had their sights set on him. Eventually, they surround his rental house, hoping he'd come outside. Soon he was tackled and arrested. Danny gets sentenced to life in prison. The police were still frustrated at several murders that he may or may not have committed. In prison he gets screened and questioned, he was asked why he did what he did, while he doesn't deny it, he says I don't know. By the next week, he had only confessed to all of the attacks we just mentioned. He claims that during each crime, he had a pressure in his head, a fog would descend and he would not remember much about it until it was over. He finally gets on death row in the late 80s. Two women interview Danny, telling him how their lives were ruined. He was in his 40s at this point. He first insisted that he can't remember details and he didn't know why he did it. Eventually, he blames it all on the rape he experienced in jail as a teenager. On December 7, 1998, he was taken into the death chamber with small viewing rooms for the family of the victims, he rambled for eight or so minutes thanking the two women for allowing him to be a part of their lives, then died by lethal injection. As we come to the end of our journey into the world of true crime, we're left with more questions than answers. The Snowtown murders and the enigmatic figure of Danny Corwin remind us of the chilling realities that exist in the darkest corners of society. Join us again for more riveting tales of crime and mystery. But until then, remember to lock your doors, stay vigilant, and never forget that evil can lurk where you least expect it.